And I'm Roger Pisby from the Skill Builder channel and I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Andrew Huddleston this morning. And Andrew, I, you tell people what you are. Good morning, Roger. Um, I'm Andy Huddleston. I'm a superintendent um, with Northumbria Police and I'm on to comment. Um, so I'm head of the National Rural Crime Unit, but basically I'm the national lead for theft of agricultural and construction equipment for the UK. Well, and that's why we're talking you not so much from the farming side, the quad bikes and all the rest of it, but very much from the van tool thefts that we get inundated, plagued with, I'd say. Um, I've spoken to a few people about this and they've, they've steered me towards you because they said that if I need to talk to somebody who's really in the know about this and can tell us what's happening, uh, you're the man. Now, a lot of our viewers are saying nothing's happening. Nothing. The police are useless. We report these crimes. Nothing gets done. These people are just getting away with it scot-free. And I know, actually, that's not the case because I've spoken to many of you in the past and I know there are things going on, but it is frustrating for tradesmen to lose their tools not once but sometimes three or four times have their vans cleaned out and feel that they're just being left alone uh, so can you offer us any glimmer of hope andrew yeah look absolutely absolutely and look I, i've been a, a victim of um, theft of um, theft of tools as well and um the link between what we do and um between the, the many of the people with vans and you've got builders tools as well is because we're bringing in um we've been responsible for the last three years developing a new law that will help hopefully help make it a lot harder for people who steal tools to do it in the first place but also to then subsequently get rid of them so this the journey that we've been on is that um so for the last seven years whilst i've been the, the lead for theft of agricultural and construction equipment one of the things that stood out was the fact that we've got construction kit out there and agricultural kit out there that doesn't have immobilizers on so it's dead easy to steal and also it's not forensically marked um now we've been pushing manufacturers to get this changed and this is where the links come across to the two manufacturers as well um but for example in the agricultural world um, if you buy a brand new Honda quad bike today, it comes with the same key that was fitted to it 42 years ago, and <laughs> which is just crazy. And and there's actually, if you Google it, there's a there's, there's a, a two minute um, Google YouTube channel on um, on how to start a quad bike in less than uh, less than 30 seconds. And basically, you can start it with a screwdriver, which yeah, you yeah. just think this is crazy. So you've got to ask yourself, well, why why are manufacturers doing this? Why is it so easy to steal? And unfortunately, the inconvenient truth is. And we know this because we've now had some academic research done around machinery theft as well as tool theft. Um, and the bottom line is theft are good for business for certain manufacturers. In yeah. fact, I would go as far as saying for some of them, it's an unscrupulous business model because every time um, a farmer or a construction worker or a builder has a tool stolen, um, the, the vast majority of people are going to replace it with exactly what they had. Um, mm. We run Honda kit, we run still, um, some of the, the, the stuff that we have. If it was stolen, I know that my best chainsaws of a certain brand, I would replace it with that because I know mm. how it works and it's a bloody good, good bit of kit. Um, yeah. The manufacturers know that, and that is why we have had the problems we've had. I've asked them, would they voluntarily, forensically mark their kits? So when we find, and we often do this, when police um, raid um, sites over the UK, we end up with police property stores full of kits. We just cannot identify it and get it back to mm. the people it belongs to because it's not marked in a way. And, and many people know the serial numbers on these tools are often very small, very difficult to see. We're asking this to be, tools to be forensically marked. So this brings me back to three years ago. Um, we started putting pressure on. I got the chance to meet with the then policing minister, Kit Malthouse, who put me in touch with um, Greg Smith MP, who was trying to do what you're actually asking for. There's better security for builders and theft from vans. So it was a coming together of theft of construction, agricultural equipment and tools where we're actually trying to achieve the same thing here to make it bloody harder for thieves and make it better, more likely for customers and um, builders to get their tools back. So that's where it started off. <laughs> Blimey. They told me you were good and uh, I think you know your subject here. Now, um, OK, I, I sense this resistance by manufacturers to do anything that uh, was going to impact their sales or reduce their sales if you like and uh, you're you're confirming that that's the the truth that they're actually dragging their feet some of them let's not say all of them some of them are dragging their feet on this whole thing when you talk about forensically marking what in practice is that 
Well, and look, please, I'll be the first to say there are some fantastic manufacturers out there who are um, doing really good stuff to make it hard to get things stolen. Um, but equally, there are some leading brands that I've been dealing with who have started conversations and suddenly realised, in my humble opinion, what it's yeah. going to cost them. So in other mm. words, it's going to cost them to forensically mark it's going mm. to get a potentially it's going to absolutely reduce their sales people builders like yourselves are not going to need to buy tools or if they are stolen there's a greater likelihood of getting them back so yeah. there's not the um moral there might be the moral motivation to do it but the commercial motivation isn't there that's why the equipment theft prevention act that got royal assent so the king signed it through july last year um, yeah. we're in now writing secondary legislation with the home office um, we hope that it's going to apply to all construction agricultural equipment, but also, crucially, um, the minister, um, I believe, is wanting this to apply to um, power tools as well. Um, they're still sorting out what that value would be, where it would be, and, and I'll come on to what the forensic marking would look like. But um, but we're having to, we, we, we shouldn't need it to have done this. But we're ha we've had to bring in a law to try and get manufacturers to do this because they won't voluntarily do it. Um, and we're, so when we talk about forensic marking, what we're talking about there is the construction industry have um, something called the Caesar scheme, which was um, constructed, yeah. uh, brought up by the construction industry um, to help counter theft of equipment, construction equipment. So if yeah. you see most, well, every JCB since 2009. So this, this is plant really, isn't it? R plant rather than hand tools or, well, power tools, yeah. It is, yeah. Roger, but the principle is exactly the same. That if you look at any JCB since 2009, it's got Caesar on it. It's marked. It's yeah. forensically marked. So it's got a tamper-proof sticker on it. It's got micro dots all over it. It's got um, RFID term readers in it as well. And we're trying to get something in a more simple scale for power tools as well. So that at least, at the very least, if you were to look to re replace whatever power tool make you've got, and you know that from 2025 onwards, that power tool's got an, um, a tamper-proof sticker on it. And if that sticker's not there, then you know there's only one reason that's been taken off. Now, I yeah. appreciate that it does cause a problem for people who will recycle tools and move them around, but we have the same with cars now. They get turned over, people swap engines, do different bits and pieces, and, and ultimately, you, most professional power tools, if they last five years, they're probably doing pretty well um, mm. before they're getting replaced. So it's in that five-year period where we need to be able to recover it, where the tool's got some value and you'd actually want it back as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Do, does, that, does, that, does that make well, sense to the link yeah, between I the mean, two worlds? It does. Uh, there's this thing about people selling their tools and so on. In my experience, that's very, very rare for anybody to legitimately sell their, their power tools. You know, they don't get fed up. I mean, sometimes, you know, they, they buy one they don't like and they sell it on. But generally, people run them until they, they, they stop and, and that's that. So I don't think that thing of people selling them and, and the, them being forensically marked is really a big issue for anybody. Um, but obviously... The other thing that we need to see is at the other end of it is when these tools are being sold some kind of legislation which stops people from removing and selling these these tools without that identification mark would, would be a serial number or as you say forensically marked but at the moment they can re remove all the identification marks off a tool and legally still sell it at a car boot or a street market or whatever so you know, we, we we know, I mean, when we go to these places, we just stand there and look at rows upon rows of stolen steel cut-off saws and so on, and you know they're not coming out of a civil, you know, engineering side. You know they're coming out the back of people's vans, but it's frustrating. You can't do a thing about it without some kind of proof. But I would just say before we go on that, you know, we keep banging on and saying, you've got to mark your tools, guys. You know, at the least mark your tools. Get yourself one of those invisible pens that show up under um, ultraviolet or something. Do anything you can because, as you say, when you seize goods, you've got no idea of, of where to return them to and they end up sitting in the store until they're, until they're auctioned off, which is really frustrating, isn't it? And, and, and Roger, there's been some stuff, um, some research done by um, Dr. Kate Tudor from Durham University. And, and in that mm -hmm. research, and, and I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff, it's yeah. fantastic in terms of actually, do you know what? It tells us some common sense, sense stuff in there. And mm -hmm. what she's also been able to tell us is that people don't like selling these tools on. The Steve's don't like selling them if they've been marked. So even if you're putting 
RB1 on your tools. Um, as soon as you come to sell it in the pub, it will hang on. Why has it got that name on it? If you're writing, or if you put Roger Bisbee on or Bisbee on the beat, mm, well, why? Yeah. Hang on. Whose tools this belong to? You're not him. Mm. Um, so there is an element of that. And you're right. The likes of eBay, um, I would like to see going forward, the likes of eBay and saying, well, you've got to put on. We know that every power tool in the UK from 2025 over a certain value has to be um, marked. I'd want to see on eBay, if you're selling something, you're putting the forensic marking number on there. Um, and the crucial bit that you can use that QR code or you can use that number and quickly check it on the internet and say, right, that is recorded as stolen or not. Um, and then it makes it safer. So if you are genuinely selling your tools and a genuine purchase, then you've got a bit more security that what you're buying is legit. Um, mm. Sadly, to be fair, Roger, I think a lot of these tools, people, it's a good deal. And when's the last time a policeman's come around and checked your tools in the back of your van when you've been on a that's, job? Um, yeah. And I think that's the reality of the people out there that will um, turn a blind eye or just not ask enough questions because they're happy to just they think they're getting a good deal. Yeah, yeah. So e eBay, I mean, there are so many different ways. Like you say, selling them in a the pub is one way, selling them on eBay or selling them on street markets, car boot sales, all the rest of it. But, I mean, if we can put some principles in place there, even if, like you say, the enforcement of it is going to be difficult logistically because obviously you know people are undermanned and all the rest of it but at least it's got some kind of curb and if people do go to a street market if you've got an inspector going to a street market where did this tool come from where's the id marks i think it that would be a, a massive leap forward can you tell me anything about vehicle security itself because again on the comments people are saying well the van manufacturers should do more to secure the vans and i think this is a tremendously difficult thing because i think short of making something like a security van with steel reinforcement those guys can get in there so i don't know how much van manufacturers can do but have you got any movement on that at all well uh, whilst my remit is the construction agri side um, but what I can say is there uh, there are some manufacturers. Again, you have got to look at well what what it is that they're selling um, and what it, as a buyer what are you demanding of them. So certain machinery manufacturers, the likes of New Holland, Manitou, they all use the same key. So for the yeah. likes of your vans, um, it'd be sort of well have have they got improved security on them so you can't do the bend back on the doors. But also I think this is where, from my knowledge, that difference between an insurance for the van covering the van and the cab, but needing secondary insurance for the back of the vehicle. Yeah. Um, and those two being different for the contents. So I think there's an issue there for the industry, but I think, look, if there was somebody who could produce a van that was um, now impossible to get into, um, yeah, like you say, what would it look like? Is it practical? Yeah. Um, I think there's, 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 there's never ever in, in, I would say one thing that's going to solve all of this because you okay. could say, we wouldn't have vans broken into if people didn't buy these second hand in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. So no, there's got to be right. there's got to be a market to sell them to. There's got to yeah. be a market to sell them to. I can categorically tell you, we will not arrest our way out of the situation. So locking people up isn't going to suddenly stop it if there's a demand for it. We've actually seen an increase in the theft of machinery um, since the sanctions on Russia because manufacturers now cannot sell to Russia. So the black market demand for machinery has gone absolutely crackers. And we're seeing in some cases, two, 300% increase in theft of construction and agricultural machinery, because I would argue we're seeing more stuff going to Eastern Europe because there is a market there that cannot be fulfilled any other way. Wow, is that applying that's... to tools as well? <laughs> I, I have got no evidence to say that, but ultimately um, there is definitely a demand in the UK. So band security, marking of it, eBay sellers, purchasers, we're all part of the um, we're all part of the solution. But vans, van manufacturers, and look, it's too, it is yeah, the, the the relatively easy to break into. Uh, but I think that's where you look at your security chest. So I, I keep my stuff in a security chest, and um, mm. yeah, lots of security on it. Where you park it at night um yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously basic things that can help reduce your likelihood of being a, a victim yeah. of theft you say yeah you say where you park it at night but I've, I've met several builders who have had their tools stolen in broad daylight either when they've gone into a merchants or you know somebody like b and q there's a guy in the car park sees them pulling somebody follows them into b and q or wherever it is uh 
and just keeps an eye on them. And if they look like they're coming out, they just phones their mate and says, all right, he's on his way back out again. Fantastically well organised, these people. I mean, if they did something legit with their lives, they'd probably be as rich, quite honestly, because they certainly got it worked out how to do it. But does that, when, when you're talking about um, machinery going abroad, does that apply to power tools as well or not? Or is it just the big JCBs and things which are broken down and sent away in parts? I've got well, I've got no evidence, um, particularly around the 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 tool side of it, because I mm. I deal with the machinery. But what I can yeah. tell you is that um, the um, if you've got a container and um, or a van and you can fill it with power tools that you've stolen, and you know there's a market that if you can get access to it, we did a job the other week where we seized over three hundred power tools. Um, and if you look at most chainsaws now, most chop off saws, they're over yeah. seven hundred and fifty quid. So yeah, you get yeah. a load of those. You get a load, even a van load. You get a load of those in a van, and you can get them out to um, it's new. You, you've actually, you, it's worth the run, isn't it? Is it possible? I think absolutely. I'm not naive enough to say that that's not happening. Um, but in terms of machinery. Um, literally yeah. um, anything that filling filling lorries up with kit um, to take out to Eastern Europe because of that demand. And what we saw, we know from the um, the wars previously that we've seen when there's a rebuild, then again mm. demand for construction building it, it is, goes yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, th- yeah. I, I think there's a risk of that, but the, I would say there's also the main risk has always been the case of that demand at home as well. Um, mm. For, for stolen tools. And, and um, we were also told that the people move them from one area to another. So if they steal them in Cornwall, they sell them in Birmingham and vice versa and all that kind of thing. So they make sure that they're not ending up in a local market close to where they've been stolen, you know. So again, they're organised, you know, they're, they're, they've got it worked out. No, look, this isn't, um, you know, you, t- you hear about, oh, I've had my van broken into and that night it's getting sold in the local pub. That mm. that that is not what we're talking about here. This yeah. is organised criminality on a large scale. Um, yeah. We've seen instances where vans have been getting broken into in multiple numbers because um, there's a tool show on. Um, so yeah. one of the uh, one of one of the construction shows, um, several of the vans got broken into because the sat the livery on the sign has been this big tool manufacturer, and oh, yeah. um, and yeah. they know that there's stuff in there. So when you're parking up, particularly when you're travelling round and you you're a workman who's tra- travelling all over the country, staying at your different. Um, Oh, premieres or wherever yeah, that's yeah. you've got to be so careful would be my do advice you know do you know what I, I when that happens to me when i've got to park up in some what i might call sketchy place you know staying in a hotel i don't sleep well because i'm constantly thinking about somebody breaking into my van while i'm sleeping and it's um it's you know sometimes when i've been to those hotels maybe five or six vans and we've all parked them really close to each other back to back and all the rest of it to try and it's almost like the old india thing of pull your wagons into a circle and you know it's just like I know it sounds daft, but honestly, at the, um, I would I would encourage you to do that. Um, yeah. But certainly, uh, certainly, even likes of um, I used to ride motorbikes, things like that. You put your motorbikes into the vans, you back them up to another van so that you, they can't yeah. get. So there are That's precautions it. you can definitely take yeah. to help yeah. reduce your likelihood of being a victim of theft. Unfortunately, there isn't a single silver bullet that's going to solve no, this. No. It's about doing a little bit of all sorts. But I do think this new legislation is going to make it better for consumers um, and harder for thieves to get rid of things. Well, that's brilliant. I mean, that's optimistic, you know, news for once on this. And I hope that people take that positively. And as I say, once again, if you're watching this and you're worried about tool theft, as you probably are, do mark your tools, whatever you do. It's not going to take long this weekend to just get one of those pens out, mark everything up, do what you can. And as Andrew says, you could even put your name on it. You know, once you put your name on it, don't put my name on it, by the way, when he said about RB, you know, don't um, put your own name on it and hopefully that will stop it being stolen. But it's great to talk to you, Andrew. And um, if we can keep up, uh, you know, make have an update from you, in the near future that would be brilliant if we if it's when's this legislation i mean you said it's gone through its uh his first reading or whatever and and it these take it went through parliament last year and um, so it had three readings in parliament then went through the house of lords went okay. uh, got royal assent in july from the king and um, so it's yeah. now a law and the secondary legislation is literally getting drafted at the moment so i would i would hope in the next few weeks Wow. Um, we're going to see a sort of an indication from the policing minister as to what it's going to cover, which is that yeah. that's going to be the crucial bit. Yeah, I, I would like to think, yeah, next year that we're in a position where we need there needs to be given some time for manufacturers to adapt yeah, to this. Yeah, that said, 
to be fair, we've been fighting for it for years, so they've known it's been coming. Um, yeah. But we're, we're, and you've already heard what we're up against in terms of commercial um, pressures. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, fingers crossed. But no, happily and delight, delighted to um, be invited to come and speak to you as well. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. I've, I've learned a lot this morning. And uh, as I say, it's just given me some hope, which uh, yeah, at one point, you know, if you'd asked me a year ago, I was thinking nothing's going to get done on this. It's just. But you've been working away behind the scenes. Enjoy the rest of your day, and thank you very much for joining us. No, very good, and keep up the um, keep up the videos and YouTube. Um, I, I like watching them as well. <laughs> we we'll keep punching away. Thank you very much. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for your time.